Hey, all you cool cats. Ready for a little fun? <laughs> That's what I thought. Pop talk. Scooby doo wah do wah Pop talk. The fun never stops, you know. Pop talk. If you're a nerd or a jock, run, don't just walk. You ready to rock, you got pop talk. Now, from Funko Hollywood, it's time for Pop Talk! Hey everybody, welcome back to another Pop Talk here with a pretty incredible guest. I am Jason, JJ Biscuits Bischoff, and I am stoked about this person, but I'm gonna let them introduce themselves. So, sir, who are you? Where are you from, and how would people know you? I don't know, uh, who am I? Such an existential question. My name is Ryan Hurst. Um, people might know me as Opie from Sons of Anarchy, number 91, Funko Pop. <laughs> and um, which is a hard to come by, which I've been told, a very hard to come by Funko Pop. So if you have one, consider yourself lucky. Um, I'm also on uh, Beta on The Walking Dead. I'm coming out as Thor in God of War Ragnarok. Been on Bates Motel, been in this business for a long time, was in a movie called Remember the Titans when I was a little baby. That's that's a, that's a good place to start. Amazing place to start, but yeah. you forgot, where are you from? Where? I, I am from planet Earth. Well, not originally, <laughs> but you know, this is my home right now. Uh, is I am born and bred in Santa Monica, California. Okay, yeah, right, right on, just down the street from here. Just down the street, man. Brilliant, brilliant. Yeah. All right, so Ryan here on Pop Talk, we love to invite our guests to really just kind of tinker away. Um, in front of you is an entirety of our Pop People parts. You are welcome to just kind of either create yourself or create a friend or maybe mm. just a creature of your own imagination. So feel free to tinker. This is your time. Okay. Cool. Well, I'm starting with a purple cape. Ooh, it's a that, choice. It's so definitely that's, that's, a that's, choice. That's the beginning. I dig that. Uh, and we do that, of course, so that our guests are entirely distracted from the incredible barrage of questions we're about to throw their yeah. way. All right, so here we go. Mr. Ryan, like you just teed up for me a second ago, you are going to be playing Thor in the yet to be released God of War Ragnarok. Right. Um, what would you say distinguishes your particular take on the character versus perhaps others that are out there in the mainstream? He is fat. <laughs> very, very, very fat. No, um, so the creators of Ragnarok came to me, and it was uh, first of all, I, I've been I was a fan of that video game from like everyone from the, from the beginning, um, and then when I got the call, they were like, they want to pitch you um, a character that they're that they're putting together for Ragnarok, and I was like, okay, and it was right when COVID started, so they uh, the the creators actually came over to my house. And we sat there for about six hours and they pitched the entire storyline, the entire thing. Rare thing for games. And it was this tapestry of really beautiful, intense uh, storytelling. And I was like, oh my God. And then they started showing me the artwork and I was like, oh, this is great. And they were like, and then this is you. And I was like, he's a, <laughs> he's a big boy. And they were like, yeah, we're going old school Norse mythology with this. And I was just like, I love this. Um, so the way that I presented him was he has a bit of pathos to him that you wouldn't necessarily expect. That there's some relationships that they that they investigate where they with his with his father, with his wife, and with his daughter. They show this other side of him that I was really, really interested in, which is that like, for one, he's a drunk hmm. and he's trying not to be a drunk for his family. Like these very sort of like off-center choices for like a Norse god. Yeah. That you don't look at a Norse god and go like, oh, really? <laughs> he feels that way? <laughs> you know, so that I, I, I tried to present it that way, if that makes sense. So you're sort of saying that the take is more of a humanistic take on a, on a god, or a god attempting to be as mortal as possible. Yeah. yeah. Right on. Yeah. If you could revisit any of the characters that you've played mm -hmm. um, and take to them, basically take them into an entirely different direction, right. whether it be absurd or something more serious, what character would you choose and where would you go with them? Hmm. Revisit to actually like shoot again or what do you mean? Like if you had the creative reins to right. make a decision around one of your characters. Um, maybe it was the uh, mortal end of somebody or... Now, I'll tell you, you, you know, I remember once I saw this interview with um, Jack Nicholson. It was in the making of The Shining. Yeah. That was um, actually directed by um, Kubrick's daughter. And, um, and they interviewed him and, he, and, they, and he said, and she said, what do you do when you work with the director when the director asks you to do something that's not necessarily in keeping with what you see as, as for the character or that you don't like? 
And he had this brilliant answer that I always sort of stay next to, which is, he said, if, if a director tells me to do something and I don't want to do it or I don't agree with it, he said 99% of the time, I'll just do my best. And he said, because I want to be out of control as an actor. You know, you mentioned earlier that you played Beta for quite some time yeah. on The Walking Dead. Can you maybe give me an example of arguably the grossest day on set for you? The grossest day? I don't know that, they, I mean, they were all gross. When I got eaten by all the zombies, always fun. Not that gross. I mean, the, 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 the knives and the eyeballs, that was pretty gross. Um, what I can give you is, I'm a 40 something year old, you know, man. I don't get, I'm, you know, I have a beard, I'm six foot five. I don't get scared very easily. Sure. But <laughs> I'll tell you, I did get creeped out once. Is, <laughs> so it's, I, th I believe it was the last episode that I was on and Beta is kind of losing his mind a little bit. And, uh, and so I'm amongst a horde of zombies and everybody's there. There's 400 background artists there and me, everyone dressed as, you know, in, in full makeup. And uh, and there's a sequence where we're all sort of like making our way towards the, the hospital. And then what happens is everyone at a certain point turns and they start chanting this mantra, which I made up by the way, which is we are the end of the world. We are the end of the world. So they all turn, and I'll tell you, <laughs> for you at home, when you have 400 or 500 zombies looking at you in unison saying, I was like, can we cut for a second? <laughs> like, this is freaky, bro. I got, I like legitimately was like, <laughs> okay, I didn't sign up for this. Um, so you, Ryan, are an actor kind of notorious for a handful of pretty incredible on-screen deaths. So to kind of recapture a little bit of that, um, Opie Winston yes. died with a pipe. Yep. Yep. Beta, mort mortally wounded, excuse me, and devoured. Correct. Um, and then uh, Chick Hogan. Which is how I'd like to go. Yeah, well, I'd as like would go. we all, uh, right? I, you know, where, uh, where is grandpa? Oh, he, he was eaten by a whale. Nice. He, he's in the <laughs> belly of a whale at the bottom of the ocean. Oh, okay. It's a bit bi biblical, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then Chick Hogan shot dead at the typewriter, right? Correct. Um, so I do have to ask, what is it like as a performer that has played some of these characters for a bit of time yeah. to find out that they are going to die? Well, it's twofold. One, I'm practicing for real life because I want to make sure that I get it right. A, a good reaction, yeah. right? And also remember, <laughs> Gary Bertier dies at the end of at the end of Remember the Titans. Too. True. Um, but also, um, you know, for different characters, uh, I I haven't felt as though any character has gone out before it should have. Sure. So that there's 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 a solace in that, and um, and most especially with Opie, also people's like. It was so heartbreaking and it was so um, tragic, but it felt so um, operatic, you know, which felt like such a natural end to the character. But as a as a human, you know, what's interesting about this, especially as an actor, again, this kind of goes back to something that I've spoken about before, which is until like maybe 15 years ago, there was only a handful of shows that would go for 10 years or 15 years. Yeah. And now they happen sort of all the time. So what it does for an actor, when you're playing the same character for 10 years, is it becomes a little bit of a different art form and a different process for the actor. So I remember distinctly after Opie uh, came to an end, I was like, I was really sad. And uh, so I wrote up this sort of like poem that I only sort of shared with the guys on Sons of Anarchy and everybody keeps, it kind of like made the rounds of comic Cons, and they're like, are you ever gonna read the thing that you wrote? And I was like, no. Uh, but it, one of the things that it talks about is that, you know, there's, there's a litany of books that talk about creating a character but they don't tell you how to kill it. Ryan, I'm a huge DC Comics okay. fan. Yep. Recently, you played Lobo in yep. Superman Man of Tomorrow. Correct. Um, if you could pit the main man against any other character from fiction, comics or otherwise, who would it be and how would it play out? Oh, gosh. That's good. Um, any, does it, do they have to be a DC character? No, no, no. no, no. I'd pit Lobo against Usagi Yojimbo. 
Brother, I love your answer. Huge TMNT fan, yeah, yeah. huge Usagi fan. Yeah. That's awesome. I have no idea how it would play, but I'd love to see it. I'd love to see. So if you're out there and you're making a comic, <laughs> do that. Make yeah. it happen, folks. We want to see it down in the comments. Yes. Um, let's see here. What's some advice you wish you had heard earlier in your career? Mm, I asked for lots of advice. I'm a big, I'm, I'm a big advice person, you know, is when I don't know something, I turn into a really, really, really good listener and a really good questioner. Hmm. Is, and it's also just sort of one of the things that, uh, you know, my mother is an acting coach and my father's an actor and my uh, uh, stepfather's a writer. So I was sort of born in, in the business, but one of the, you know, my mother is sort of a master teacher in, in terms of acting, uh, in that she teaches you without you really knowing that you're being taught. And she raised me that way also, is for my entire life, is how my mother saw something or felt about something, I never knew. Because everything out of her mouth was asking me an empowering question. Hmm. Um, was it your mom that ultimately inspired you into this trade? Was it a performance perhaps by somebody else that inspired you to go down this path? Um, so, I, yeah, of course, my mother and father, of course, like they wanted me to do anything but acting because it's the hardest thing in the world, you know, and for all of you kids out there who are like, should I be an actor? Unless you have to be an actor, don't be an actor, <laughs> is if you can be happy doing something else, do something else. Uh, because this business is 99% just, you know, f feeling, you know, rejection is that is is at the end of the day, what do they say is like the acting you do for free, they're paying you for the five years of rejection yep. that you just had. In terms of people, it was actually Robin Williams who, when I was, um, when I was probably nine years old, I remember I saved up my allowance for six months. This was back when you had to buy a VHS tape and each VHS tape, remember when they cost like $250? Oh yeah. So I saved up $250 and I bought the VHS from the warehouse for uh, Robin Williams at the Metropolitan Opera House. Amazing. And I watched it over and 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 over again. And, uh, and he, he was this true inspiration for me. And uh, when, he, when he passed away, I cried like a baby. And uh, the, I worked on a movie with him called Patch Adams. I, in, in the movie, it was just this tiny little role, but I, there was a one uh, they, they cut out a bunch of it, but there was probably three weeks there where it was a dream scenario. It was me, Alan Tudyk, uh, Robin Williams in a room that we were, we were playing lunatics and we were improving all day, every day for three weeks. And it was heaven. It was heaven. And I remember saying to him, uh, and I had this precious little moment where I walked up to him and I introduced myself and I said, I just need to let you know. I said, nine, I said, nine year old Ryan Hurst was out, not playing with his friends. He was not sleeping over. He was sitting there watching Robin Williams at the Metropolitan Opera House and memorizing every single word. And he like, grabs my hand and he puts it on his chest and he goes, that'll get me through today. Hmm. Just letting you know, that'll get me through today. I didn't know what it meant at the time, but uh, but I remember just what, that was one of the most uh, beautiful experiences of my life. Wow, I yeah. really appreciate that's you sharing good. that story. Yeah, it's a good one. But look at but look at this. Let's let's actually dive into that for a second. Yeah. So, <clears throat> Ryan, you have graced us with this incredible creation. Yeah. Can you help explain the purple caped, blue haired, scepter wielding person before us? No, no, I can't. <laughs> I think it just look. It just you know. This is, I mean, this is probably how I think of myself inside. I like it. A little bit is, I, I think it's, it's got, you know, it's got style, it's got some royalness to it, some regalness. Hair looks fantastic. I'm getting some hey ya vibes from yes, it. Yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Big, yeah, but no, totally. Totally, that's got an outcast vibe to it. Yeah. Um, is, uh, yeah, no, I, I, I think it, that feels like a little, you know, she's got some prana in there. That's, that, that, that's who she feels like. I don't got a name for her yet. I'll take it. Think of it. You got a couple minutes. All right. All right, Ryan, a couple quick fire at you. Um, can you give us your favorite swear word that's not a swear? I'm still going with fart. <laughs> Me it's too. Not, it's not really, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, a guy, it's got art in it and F. So, yeah. Yeah, it's fart. Fart. Good choice. Good choice. Um, best score ever integrated in a film? 
That's scored great. Or song, original song, that works too. I, I mean, I'd have to go with an old, I, I, I'd, you know, a child of the 70s, I'd have to go with the classics. I'd either have to go Superman or Star Wars. <laughs> is John Williams, you know, he's just on another level, is is the fact that there's no words to any of his songs, but you feel like there are, is just amazing. What about TV? TV, uh, in terms of like themes? Sure. A-team, all day long. A-team, good yeah, pick, yeah. good pull. Ryan, if you could fly, turn invisible, or read minds, what would you choose? Fly all day long. Why? Uh, well, I'm, I've been a skydiver for 20 years. I have 2,500 jumps. I got my license years ago. It's the best thing in the whole world. Very it's cool. It's the best thing in the whole world. All right, very serious question here. Okay. In a battle between all of the serial mascots, Trix the Rabbit, Lucky the Leprechaun, for example, who comes out on top as the number one serial killer? Well, it's, I mean, it's kind of a dorky answer, but you gotta go Tony the Tiger. He's a tiger. Ooh. <laughs> you know, I mean, he's a tiger. The rest of, you know, Count Chocolate doesn't stand up to a tiger. Mm. Um, yeah, I'm going Tony Tiger. I'd love to see you on a bad day. That'd be great. <laughs> That'd be great. All right, Ryan, we're gonna show, uh, we're gonna shoot a couple others your way. Just have some fun with it. All so, right. favorite movie of all time? Cool Hand Luke. You know, there's a friend of mine named Hadrian B. Love, and he, he was a guy who opened up uh, he, he revamped the silent movie theater to a place called Cine Family. Uh, I've known him since grade school, and he, he is a true cinephile. He would, he would watch eight to 10 movies a day. And, uh, and I lived across the street from him, and then he, uh, he came to my door at two o'clock in the morning one day, and he was like, knocked on the door. He's just like, I just found your favorite movie. And I was like, I was like, really? And he was just like, you gotta come over. I was like, all right. Went over there, put it on, and I was like, you're damn right. That's my favorite movie. <laughs> what we got here is a failure to communicate. So again, Ryan, uh, thank you again. Have you thought of a name for the friend that you have made today? Mm, Sarah. Sarah. Yeah. Ryan, then we do leave you with one final question. What is, what it, is it like to be popped? Indeed. What is it like to be popped? It's the best, man. It's the best. First of all, I've, I've been a fan of Pops and the company since its inception. Thank you. I'm, and I am over the moon to be able to be able to participate here. But to, to, for people to walk up and, and to let me sign their Pop of me, it's the best. Yeah. It's legitimately the best. Um, you know, is it it outdoes for whatever reason. It has this this place in my heart that's not, you know, because there's action figures of me, there's action figures of Beta, but I, the, the, the pop vibe I've been a fan of since the beginning. So thank you so much for that. No, no, truly thank you. We, you know, as I like to say, we exist at the intersection of everyone's favorite stuff. Yeah. That affords us a place of privilege and we're very grateful to have friends of Funko like yourself. So again, this is Funko Pop Talk. We appreciate your time, everybody. Have a happy day. Yay!